So, uh, intro music. Yeah, <laughs> I don't have it hooked up. I you should probably it? have it hooked up. Ah, it's too late. No, no, we don't need it. Okay, so yeah, I did. I haven't asked you about your tour yet because I thought we might have a conversation about it. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, tell me about that. Oh uh, well, so we were out for almost a month to the day. Um, we started in Atlanta, no, uh, Athens, Georgia, um, and we uh, ended in Lake Tahoe in California. Whoa. And, yeah, so. All was, the way. All the way. Yeah, started and kind of did like a like a big horseshoe almost. We kind of like, we went up to the Midwest and hit through Colorado and um, Montana, up into Seattle and California. It was it was it was great. That's man. crazy. How many days or how many shows was it? Uh, 15, 20 shows. Yeah, it was. I, that, don't quote me on that, but it was. A, yeah. yeah, it was. It was a lot of shows. Oh man. So is that like the most extensive cluster of shows you've played? Uh, just about. I mean, we may have done some like two, three week things that were kind of like more intense, like back to back to back to back shows, but like. Yeah. That was definitely, I think, the longest we've been out in one stretch. I think we may, we may have done another week or, or uh, like, month long, but that was about, if not the most equivalent to the most. So was it, like, concentrated on the weekends, or was it kind of, like, pretty even throughout the whole thing? No, man. Our, you know, our, our, our booking did pretty well about, like, trying to get us from city to city, kind of connecting-wise. Um so, which can be good and bad because sometimes, you know, people aren't coming out as much on a Monday or Tuesday. You know, obviously there are better attended shows were on Fridays and Saturdays. But um, as far as, like, routing-wise, like, it's it's nice to, like, play and then go to a city that's close by, you know, the next day. As opposed to being, like, you have, you know, two days off, but, like, you have to get, you know, yeah. a thousand miles away. <laughs> So. Right, yeah. So what was what was like the furthest you had to go for between shows? So we um probably from like when we were like St. Louis and then we went St. Louis to Omaha and then Omaha to like Fort Collins. When you get getting across those plains can be brutal. Oh so, yeah. <laughs> just it it's like seems like it's at least six hours. Places. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Um and then like well, you know, every place is it get presents its kind of like own challenges because then like going through like parts of Colorado, it's super beautiful, but it's like you know you're going up and down through the mountains. You 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 know because you've been out there, so it's just like Colorado is like awesome, but it's also super stressful sometimes to drive through because it's just in in a van anyways. If I yeah. if, if I had like a my my Subaru and it was just me, you know. Me, oh yeah, different you, story. But, you might be going up a mountain for like several miles, just like five miles dang. to the gallon. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah. So what how, was it? Was it a success? Define what's a success. <laughs> <laughs> I think. Do you so. want to do it again? Do I want to do it again? I mean, I think that yeah. I think it's what we signed up for. You know, if you, yeah. you know, especially for for us, like uh, live music, like is, is our sort of bread and butter. Not that we don't love making records, or the, but I think just what our fans come out to see us for, I think, is mainly. Because they, you know, I think certain. That closer. Okay, All right, better. I think you know cer- certain. I, I talked to the buddy about uh, about this once. But like, cer- some bands you, you go to see them, because you like the record, and some bands you listen to the record because you want to, you know what I mean? Because you like to see them live. Yeah. You know, I think. The great great bands do, it all, but some bands do, one thing maybe better than the other. They're very different art forms, in my opinion. Uh, live music versus recording, you know. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely hard to... Uh, I definitely started out a lot... Well, I've kind of been doing both for a while, but mm. recording's definitely, like, where I'm more comfortable. Mm. And the live, live stuff's kind of trying to trying to match the recording side. Yeah, and and, like, for us, I think, you know... When we went to record this latest record, we wanted to capture more of a live vibe. Yeah. You know, we, we tried to track things together, like the rhythm section together. Yeah, it's really because, important. Yeah, because like people listen to our first record, and one of the most, like the most consistent critiques I got of, of it was like, it's great, but it's like, 
we wanted like a more live feeling like it really? sounds yeah oh, i mean a lot, a lot of people i mean to me, to me at least but yeah so, said there was like you know it just sounded produced which can be great you know but like some people were like i want that kind of like live common heart vibe they want it yeah they wanted the, mm-hmm. the captured mm-hmm. live yeah it's hard to reproduce that uh if you don't do it if you don't actually just do it together mm-hmm. live yeah it's kind but, of yeah. Sorry, sorry. No, but, but at the same time, like what my what I'm, I guess what I'm trying to say is like when you go and record stuff, you do different things, right? You know, the, you have the advantage of like, okay, well, I'm going to do all these layers and I'm going to yeah. put cool effects on the vocals. And that can be awesome. And, you know, but also it's, it's definitely different than what you're going to sound like live. And also like for us, okay, let's extend this guitar solo for a whole while when we're doing it live. But yeah. when we're recording, people don't necessarily want to hear four yeah. minutes of guitar so <laughs> i don't want to keep it keep it no. more concise i guess yeah yeah but where, to, where'd you record it we recorded it's called uh, the uh gradwell gladwell gradwell house i believe it's called in uh haddon heights new jersey um oh, wow. which is like basically philadelphia area how sure. did that how'd that come to be so we um uh we were looking for somebody to produce the the new record i mean this was a couple of years ago now um, and uh, our producer, Jeremy McDonald, he's actually from here originally, but he now uh, lives in Brooklyn and has his own studio. But for, like, big live tracking stuff, which he... Uh, his studio was, like, too small to have all of us at once, and so he wanted a big live room, and that's apparently the place he goes to do, like, his big live tracking stuff, if yeah. I recall correctly. <laughs> Interesting. So you guys... What was the recording process? Um. So we we when and we kind of it was we did uh just the rhythm section and kind of clinton first we did like uh bass drums and guitar and myself all kind of at once and that i think that again to what i was saying before like that kind of live vibe is kind of caught best better than than the previous previous record uh album because of that because we yeah. all recorded it at once um, and like also because on some of the tracks, Clinton also sang at the same time as, oh. as we, yeah. And like, you can kind of tell like when some of his like really vivacious vocals are like when he was like really, he was in the room yeah. feeling it, you know? Yeah. It's really hard to recreate that when you're not in the room. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Okay. Good. <laughs> I always mess something up. No, nah, man, these, I'm just... With these cameras. You gotta take off this jacket and sweat. You're putting me on the spot. But yeah, that... That, uh... That's kind of how I want to do the next album that we do as a band. Uh, kind of try and get, get all the songs and ideas down together. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then do the rhythm section live, or, you know, all together. Mm-hmm. And then probably save... Maybe do a couple takes with with solos, or yeah, probably wouldn't do vocals live for me because that's not not my thing. Mm-hmm. But yeah, probably save the the tricky stuff for when I have unlimited time to do yeah. it. But you have a point. Like a lot of times, things come out whenever you're you know in the room and you can feel the drums and mm-hmm. everybody's kind of on the same wavelength. It's hard to. It's not the same as when you just like turn on the turn on the recording and you're you know playing by yourself yeah and well like it wasn't just like and and to be clear like not all of clinton's vocals were done live and a lot of the vocals and (laughs) horns were done after the fact which is nice too because then you can also once you have the rhythm section you can kind of play a bit more with the sort of icing on the cake if you will you know what i mean yeah um and also like but but some of Minda's best guitar solos, in my opinion, were were when he was were live. Like he kind of wanted to go back and retake them. We're like, no man, like that was the take, that was killing. Yeah, because yeah. he's feeding off of the rest of the band, you know, at least the rhythm section. You know, that's cool. So, how long did it take you guys? So the we we it was definitely very packed. We did like four or five days. We did the the, the rhythm section tracking and then um and then we did some of the layering with the horns and vocals and then we had a couple spots where uh, like 
we we went to then to Brooklyn to his studio to do some more of the vocals and horns and some of the other you know rhythm guitars or other extra layers we yeah kind of, some of the layering stuff we did sort of after that initial week or so but it was definitely it was like very fast paced which again I think kind of presents itself well to what we're kind of going for because like yeah we instead of you know some people when we did the last record it was like let's do it over the course of a year and yeah you can overthink things exactly pretty easy and yeah get to a point of diminishing returns <laughs> with yeah. your analysis yeah whereas like i mean i think the best thing that jeremy our producer did for us was he would he had a really good sense of like when something feels good and when it doesn't feel good and he, he would just be like you can do that better it can feel better you guys weren't tight enough but yeah. then like there were other times where we would think oh that was like that slowed down a little bit yeah it didn't i didn't play this exactly perfectly or something and he'd be like no like that was the take you know and it was nice. it's good to have that sort of like outside opinion yeah for yeah. sure to to kind of <laughs> let you know when you're yeah when something's good the way you know you mm-hmm. don't have to keep doing it yeah Espe- especially in a band like us <clears throat> where, where we have uh, like a lot of us are our own worst critics which is a gift and a curse you know so it's like it's good for getting better because you're always like i can do better than that i can always do better yeah but but also when you go to record you're like i can always do better i can always do better yeah and, you could keep going for yeah. unnecessarily long I know, like Mike and I talk a lot about how his, one of his heroes, her, heroes, Jimmy Page, you know, Zeppelin, w- always would have the same kind of reaction. He would take a solo. He takes all these solos, and he would always think, "Oh, like this isn't good enough. This isn't good enough." He had to have like his producer be like, "No, man, like that was gold." You yeah. Know? So that yeah, that's pretty valuable. That's the that's the drawback of of self recording. You don't yeah necessarily. I guess you could seek it out though if you found somebody to give an opinion. Did you do a lot of? Uh, what was like the the process like before you got to the studio? Did you guys have a dedicated block of time to like get everything figured out? Well, so a lot of the songs by that point had had kind of you know settled. We a lot of them had been most of them, not all of them had, but most of them we'd been playing for a while already. So we kind of yeah. had a good idea of how how we wanted them. We did a lot of pre production. We did some demo uh, stuff and. Um, and then we also, um, Clinton, I remember one thing that I think was really beneficial was he he asked us, like, each to go through the songs and kind of um, write down a reference track. So he'd say, like, okay, for this track, what's the kind of song that you, how do you envision this song sounding? So, for example, he'd be like, this song, oh, I, I hear it as a Sly in the Family Stone kind of song, and, and here's the track i'm thinking of specifically and that's what i want the bass to sound like that's what i want the drums to sound like that's what i hear the keys sound you know specifically more to your own instrument but we kind of went through each song and said you know i wrote down like a list of the songs i had in mind yeah and and that was a really good um thing to just for for myself to also to kind of think of specific things i might want to play or how i wanted to sit in the mix or whatever um but then jeremy did a lot for us as well as just far as like trimming the fat he was he did not hold back but in a good way he was i think again that's the benefit of a producer he yeah. said this isn't you know this part of the song you don't need this part of the song oh, okay need. so he yeah. was involved with that with like the song arrangements and stuff too yeah v- very much so as far as like telling us what we needed and didn't need you yeah. know we talk about like oh you know you and i are like let's just we want to do all, it all we want this <laughs> this ending yeah. this ending we'll the song both. yeah and the song ends up being 15 minutes long and he would be like no this one you know oh uh, yeah but but he had a he had a very good way of of saying it to you he, he had a way of being nice about it which is another really good right quality like, of producer this is a great song i think it would have more an impact if this was yeah exactly he would like this it, instead yeah yeah so he was definitely a really That's key cool. player in the and just kind of bringing out the best of the band i think in the recording process the role of a producer yeah it's a tough role, man. That's yeah. Not for everybody. I know a lot of people, you know, I got some buddies down in Nashville that all, you know, everybody wants to be a producer, but, like, I don't think everybody has the, you know, the the sort of, um, I don't know. Yeah, like, the, the uh, ability to, like, know how things should go together, I guess. Yeah, you, you know, to be a pretty good producer, you have to think very holistically, you know, and you have to be able to 
think of the song as a whole, you know, and, and what, what does the song need? Yeah. And, and again, like, how do I take this band's idea and make it the best version of it? And some people are just like, you know, they were too informed by our own biases, you know, like maybe I really just want a keys solo and really the song doesn't need a key solo, you know, or yeah, can, just to be the ultimate objective servant yeah. of the song servant of the song and yeah it's a it's a it's a big it's a big concept that yeah know, i think we all could use you know put put more th- more thought into that idea. for sure yeah it definitely is an art in itself being able to kind of see the see the big picture with that so you've been working with he did your first album no our first album we did here with uh, dave heidick um, uh, I don't think I know him. He uh, he works now at the church studio in uh, Brooklyn. Brooklyn. Plug. Shameless plug. <laughs> Brooklyn <laughs> Church Bro- Studio. Church Studios. They're, Wait, they're great, man. Okay, that's what it's called, Church Studios? I believe it's, yeah, it's called it The out. Church. Yeah. Man, they're I great, man. And I, he did a great job on the first record, too. I, I really love the first record yeah. as well. Yeah, like, that was 2017? So, 16. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, so we released that in 2016, and then we went and recorded this most recent one, I think fall 2017, and then we just released it this past August. So it's been a process. But. Nice. So do you have any any favorite parts of the the last month of the you mean the tour? Yeah. Yeah, man. The Pacific Northwest. Uh, I got a lot of family out there. My, my dad's originally from from Oregon, and we used to go out there every summer. So, like, every time I go back out there, it's like being back home. What part? The, of, of Oregon. Um, he's from, it's called Woodburn. It's a little uh, south of, of Portland. Uh, okay. Portland's one Salem? of my favorite. Is it? Yeah, it's, yeah it's, it's around there. Okay. there. Yep. Uh, Portland's one of my favorite cities. And it was it's one of, I think, the band's favorite cities. Everybody's looking forward to it. Yeah. It's kind of funny. I remember the first time we went, we, we toured out to Seattle. Clinton kept saying to me, he's like, you're smiling so much. I'm like. I'm like, he's like, well, I'm like oh, sorry, man. I'm happy out here. <laughs> just love it out here. The That's awesome. Is, is it? Is it? Is it just the? Uh, is it like the environment, or is it the sh- the quality of the shows, or is it just the history you have there? A little bit of of all of it. I think um, we've had some really good shows in Oregon. We did it when we did a this tour opening up for JJ Gray and Mofro last January. I guess it was. Um, we some of our best shows were in the, on the West Coast. We had a really great show at the Crystal Ballroom in in uh, Portland, and that was killing. And I think that's one of the reasons one of our best shows on this past tour was also in Portland. Some of our best attended um, because I think that show was just really special. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, and then yeah, just like I just love the mountains and the the air and. Like, I even love the rain. Everybody hates the rain, and I'm just, like, happy. <laughs> it's pretty, yeah, that, that region's pretty amazing for the variety of landscape. I mean, you've got yeah. everything. you got mountain, beach, like, coast, yeah. desert. Yeah. Uh, forest. Snow. You just got, you, get, you know, just all you want, man. Yeah. Yeah, I've only been there once to Oregon, and I remember being pretty amazed that, you know, in the same trip to see, you know, people surfing, Mm-hmm. and people snowboarding mm-hmm. and just like everywhere in between just mm-hmm. you know within five hours yeah man it's pretty crazy Does, yeah like you, you live in a place like portland you you're just a couple hours from ev- everything you go you know you're less than two three hours to the to the ocean two hours to the, the mountains not even you know and yeah yeah and people out there i think most people they they go out there be, and same thing with like Colorado and a lot of the West is because they want to be out in nature. You know, they they love to bike ride, they love to ski, they love to surf, they love to whatever. You know, yeah. so I think that's part of the thing. You know, people are like, I, you know, I think maybe that's one of the reasons people are also just like chiller or happier because they like they like where they are. You know, they, yeah, they go out in nature a lot. You know, I don't know, I'm speculating, but no, for sure. <clears throat> and I think about that, but then I also came to realize that if I lived somewhere, I probably would still be spending most of my time inside, like yeah. working on music. Because <laughs> yeah. uh, I was just thinking about, it. I'm like, man, when would I even do that? Mm. Like, I, I usually just want to be like working on stuff. Yeah, it'd be nice to have the option. Do you have? Do you do any outdoor outdoor activities? Do you? 
I do hiking. I've yeah. done some climbing. I've, mm. I've, uh, I like to camp. Mm. Uh, I mean, I love love coast stuff. I I snowboarded for a while, but mm. I I haven't in long. Well, yeah, probably a couple of years. Yeah, expensive hobby. <laughs> yeah, just I I don't have the uh, don't have the gear anymore. Yeah, uh, but I like snowboarding mm. and. Um, yeah, I like doing that stuff, but you know, mm. uh, I am not sure how much I would actually do it. Yeah, or I was that's I was true. thinking about it, I'm like, I don't know how much I would actually get out, get out. Yeah, but maybe if you went out there, you'd be inspired to go out more often. You know, I probably would be. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think it's important to. I mean, and this is just my personal philosophy. And I think I'm sure some people disagree with me. I think it's important to as a musician to have other things too. I think, you know, a lot of us, sometimes we're just so invested in our craft and we're just, you know, writing songs or working on songs and we're practicing this and we're, you know, trying to learn new things about music all the time. That's great. It's great to be obsessed by music, but I think it's also really good to a step away from music. Sometimes let yourself breathe and recoup. And also just to like, Something that uh, really spoke to me, I read uh, Springsteen's, Bruce Springsteen's autobiography, and one thing he talked about a lot was that, like, to 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 be a good musician, you have to have a good life, or, they, or a, you know, you have to have experiences, especially for him as a songwriter. He said you can't really write good songs without good experiences. Yeah. You know. So yeah, I think, you need some, yeah, hmm. inspiration. Yeah, go out and, you know, do uh, do other things, you know, because, I mean, you sit in a room too long, you might run out of ideas. <laughs> <laughs> run, yeah, you just start to get into weird places. <laughs> yeah, man. I mean, I mean, that's, I mean, that's just my 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 kind of personal philosophy. But maybe maybe just going For down sure. the mountains maybe just makes you too much of a jam band. But <laughs> you know, balance balance is definitely really important. Yeah. Yeah, I, or like being into a sports or something like you know, like going to a baseball game or something. Yeah. You know, just just to clear your head from time to time. Yeah, definitely. Definitely try to keep keep a uh, couple things going for balance yeah. with uh, you know doing uh, doing other things like writing and yeah exercise yeah yeah <laughs> I mean what, what, whatever it is I just think it's sometimes I, and I say that as someone who is who that I have to remind myself of that a lot you know sometimes I'm just like practicing you know, in my room for hours and hours. And I'm just like, I need to take a break and go do something else. You yeah. Know, just to get, yeah. I definitely do that. Yeah. I'll just, I'll just go drive somewhere just to like go see something else. Yeah. It's healthy, man. It's healthy. It's good for the brain. Yeah. It is good for the brain. Good for the brain. Good for the soul. How do you, how do you, uh, practice? Do I practice? Like how, how do you, how, um, well, these days, I think mostly what I try to do is try. I try to learn new songs. I try to make a point of like every day or as much as I can adhere to that. Try to learn a new song. And uh, yeah, like you know, try to pick something something that's also like a little bit out of my comfort zone. You know, so um, you know, maybe it's uh, just a different genre that I've been playing recently, yeah. or a classical piece or something. Try to do something that I that tries to kind of you know turn yeah. my brain on its head so you're bit. reading do you do like you get like a chart or you're trying to do it uh from by ear or? i try to do stuff by ear mostly yeah, i like doing like stuff i just like kind of go on youtube and find a song i like and yeah and youtube has the the cool trick that you can slow things down which i always tell my students i'm like oh yeah you know you can you can slow it down and you can practice in half speed and you can go down to a quarter speed and that's that's nice yeah yeah, I've I've used that function before to kind of, yeah, because it, mm. yeah, sometimes when at a certain speed it just I can't decipher what's going on. Sure, especially if it's like a really fast bit yeah. or something. Yeah. And it seems like the more, as a you know as I've progressed, mm. you know I'm able to to decipher more complicated sounding things that are faster than I used to. Yeah, I, I imagine mean, it's probably the same. Oh, for, for sure. You. The more you do it, the better you get at it. You know. I mean, which sounds obvious, but like I, a lot of my when I when I start trying to teach my students to to learn things by ear, they get very overwhelmed by it. And I'm like, let's learn something simple at first by ear, and then you, you know, just like anything else, the more you do it, the more you're like, you just kind of start to hear yeah. stuff. And I know, yeah, definitely, you kind of, or at least, yeah, you kind of have like a catalog of these common things that come up in songs a lot, like yeah. Uh, 
that you just recognize the sound of. Like those yeah. in the thing we we're doing today, like the some of those like turnaround things sound familiar to me. Mm-hmm. If I knew what they were, like I would be able to identify them easier. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I'm sure you can identify what's going on when you hear like, you know, three chords in a row that's like a Yeah. The two five one. Yeah, this is the two five one. But you know, the <laughs> alternates of that and yeah. like, oh it's just a blah blah blah. I don't know the yeah man. Well, I'll, I'll tell you substitutes. What, what I the way I one of the kind of analogies I I've used is that um, what it reminds me a lot of is um, I studied abroad in Japan and when I when I when I was first there like the first like month I was there when they would speak Japanese to me it would just sound like just I I couldn't even decipher any of it and I and then as I went along along it, I started to be able to tell those kind of like cadences okay and so here's where one word ends and here's where one word begins and then you kind of it then just progresses and then you start to go okay well this word means this and this word means this and this was this sentence and then you know then you start to attribute the the that to meaning you know and yeah i think music is similar like you said like you start to be able to hear those turnarounds and at first when you don't have any sort of frame of reference when you don't know any of those chords you just kind of it hits you like a, you know, just a wall of sound. Yeah, you're like, what was that? Yeah, and then you're like, oh, that's a sus chord. Okay, that's a alt chord, you know, or whatever. And then you, you know, you start to kind of learn the the cadences and, and whatnot. So did you pick up on the language then by the end? Did yeah. You, you could I, understand a little bit? Yeah, I kind of made a point of, like, I really wanted to go and learn a new language. And I was there for a um, better part of a year. Um, and, yeah, like tried to I really worked hard at it and i think you know being musically sort of inclined helped a lot but interesting yeah there's a lot of parallels there yeah for sure you know it, it was it was a tough year but it was yeah it was also a great were, yeah were you doing yeah. music there no you know actually was, i took a year off and uh well i didn't take a year off but like i took a year off from music specifically i ended up having to do two more years when i came back here but um uh i i, I took a year off to study just like language and, and culture and oh, whatnot sounds awesome yeah it, it was it was great but like you know it's it's again much like the music business it's also like when people ask you about it and they just like oh that sounds great i was like it was really great it was also super tough because like, <laughs> yeah. you know, you're like you're like because well, like the first couple months i was there i had no friends and didn't understand anything that was being spoken to yeah me. did Got you know some... anybody there like, no know? wow no. uh not not initially just, nobody right I was the only person from I went you know, from Duquesne who went there, and um, I mean that year, anyways. And uh, I went to a I entered a dorm that was a like a all male traditional Japanese dorm. So it was like there was like very like where we speak Japanese and like only Japanese. They didn't speak to me in, in English. Oh my at god! All. So it was it was, it, was, it was pretty tough for year. They had a couple guys who spoke uh, a little bit of English, and there was a one uh, indian guy who who spoke good english and man, he helped me out that must have been tough it was it, it, the, the culture shock was real man it was pretty t- it was pretty tough but but it was yeah. it, at the end of the year it was like it was the best year ever you know? wow well, i'm sure that experience was something that probably showed you a lot of stuff about a bunch of stuff <laughs> well yeah you know because so um you know I, I i knew for a while that i wanted to study abroad and um i I really wanted to go to like a Eastern Asian country because there's I, I kind of thought that the that the, the Eastern Asian culture is just very foreign to to a lot of us. That I think a lot of people don't really understand the kind of the philosophy and just mentality of a lot of those cultures because it's not like Western culture a lot. Like a lot of like, and, and that sounds again very obvious, but just the like Japanese culture is very sort of group centric. It's very much about uh, again, like the the whole as opposed to the individual. Whereas like American culture is very about you know manifest destiny. It's all about the yeah about what you want and interesting you lift yourself up and that by doing so you lift up your community. Whereas like in, J- Jap- in Japan you definitely have like this idea of like don't stand out too much because you're you should be supporting 
the society as a whole. Oh, which has, that's cool. Yeah, I mean, it, that, there's pluses and minuses. Yeah. We could do an entire another podcast <laughs> about the, <laughs> the intricacies yeah. of Japanese culture, and I don't want to... I don't want to like try to act like I'm an expert on it. Just my uh, sort of observations from being there for, yeah. for a little bit. Did you, when you got back from that, did you kind of, do you have any kind of realizations about, you know, what you wanted to do when you got back to the United States? Yeah. Well, so the, the main thing I, I learned was that, I, that music was definitely going to be a major part of my life because like, I, I also kind of took that, that was between my sophomore and junior year. And I was like, I, I'm going to just see also how not playing music every day is going to kind of affect me. Um, and I did, like, I had a keyboard and whatnot. I would go to some jams, especially, you know, once I made some friends and kind of learned my way around, I started playing some more. But, like, it wasn't at all like being in music school where it's like, you know, 24 7 every day you're learning about music and whatnot. And so when I came back, I knew that I, that that year taught me that I wasn't really happy if I didn't, like, yeah. Yeah, you know. it's kind of just reinforced your decision. Yeah, which is that's you know, good. It's yeah. good. Sometimes you need that. Otherwise, you do you wonder like, you know, yeah, just some some assurance. Yeah. So, before college, how long you been? Had you been playing the piano? Uh, I I started man probably in like fourth grade playing piano, but like I was a terrible student. I tell people this all the time. I was really bad for most of. Them my my kind of childhood and what and i always kind of say that guitar saved my love of or guitar kind of made me fall in love with the piano because i didn't really really enjoy music until i got to high school and i started playing guitar in bands and then then i was like oh keyboards are cool too you know <laughs> it's like because before it was just like you know playing classical music and doing your scales and doing your lesson is it, well it just wasn't really particularly enjoyable to me and like i i learned you know i I did practice and whatnot i didn't really enjoy it that much um and i don't think i was like particularly good at it but, you know I, I was fine and then uh you know high school happens and people are like oh you play an instrument that's cool you know and, yeah you know, and then you start you start to kind of take it more seriously and then you know but yeah there's definitely yeah big big shift uh yeah, whenever you we pick an instrument up again with a different kind of perspective. So yeah. I, I feel like the same thing happened with, with me. Uh, I played violin, like classical violin, for probably for, uh, from like ages of five to nine. Mm. And then I, I, you know, the same thing. I was, I was playing classical music. Was, you know, really happy that I, that I did that because it kind of... Yeah got all that stuff in my head mm -hmm. at a young age but then I, I stopped for you know till high school and mm -hmm. then in high school I decided you know I want to do it again and then when mm -hmm. I did it again it was a lot more enjoyable yeah. uh, just kind of kind of yeah rediscovering a, yeah. a love of it it's a you know I think a lot of people can relate to that I think I mean I see it with my my students all the time too it's like you know, it's it's hard to for it's hard to tell kids, hey, if you do this thing that you don't like for years, one day you'll be really good at it and you'll love it. You know, <laughs> yeah. like, but like right now, it's just you don't. You know, it, it's it's hard to kind of. I, I try to find that balance, and it can be hard to the balance of like finding something that they're gonna really enjoy to play, but also is really kind of like helping them Push, get better. Pushes them yeah, around. you know, because it's yeah, it's 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 uncomfortable. Yeah, to, mm. to be trying to do things that you can't do mm. you know and you have to like mm. go through that yeah you know and, the, and especially like i mean this has probably been true for a while but especially now like a lot of these kids want to learn these like rap songs or whatnot and it and there's like huh. not really a How easy you way like you, chords uh, you hope you find something that has a cool chord progression but even then they like they want to play you know the melody which is natural and it's very hard to do because, you know, if they're rapping, there's really not any melody. And some of the songs, you know, like you do a Post Malone song and it's like it's just repeated notes over and over and over again. And it's, again, it doesn't really lend itself well to yeah. the keyboard. Oh, interesting. So it's kind of a self-guided, uh, kind of a self-guided, like people have things they want to learn. 
Yeah, you know, again, you try to find that balance of like, hey, you will, we'll do this, you know, we'll do the song that's fun for you, but you, if, but you do my kind of yeah. song that I want you to learn as well. You know, let's let's learn this Beethoven <laughs> thing, but or I mean, like, and when you're blessed to to get those kids who are really interested in like classical music too, it's great. But like, uh, some, but the 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 problem that I've occasionally run into there is that like. I have these kids who love classical music, but they listen to these like crazy classical pieces. They're like, I want to play this. And I'm like, cool. To be able to play that, we have to start here and learn this like, you know, twinkle, twinkle, little star. And they're like, I, I don't hate that. That's I, I don't want to play that. It's boring. You know, I hate that. It's, it's garbage. Yeah. I want to play this like super cool thing. I'm like, I know that's, that's obviously the thing you want to play, but we yeah. have to learn this first, you know? Yeah. It's, it's tough. I would imagine. Yeah. Uh, so when you said, in high school, you played in band guitar, like jazz band. No, no, no. So like, like rock bands. Like, like played I'm, in a band with your friends. Yeah. Well, so it was. Man, make me, make me go down memory lane with all my crazy experiences of high school. <laughs> um, so it was it was weird because I was way more I was way more like jock central like sports and all that. I was much more interested in playing like basketball and baseball than music. Um, and then a couple of different things I think sort of turned the corner for me. Um, uh, and I I didn't make a couple of sports teams that I wanted to make, which so I kind of was like looking for something else to do. And um, I, I that that was a that was a time when I would we would you know people would go home and we would watch like just YouTube videos like the people that like your friends were showing you like because before like you know the instagram and all that where you just send each other, each other memes like you come into homeroom and people would be like hey watch this like cool video and then you would go home and you'd look it up on youtube and then the next day yeah. you come back in and talk about it <laughs> so like my, i remember one of my friends he he was like you need to check out this this acdc video and it was a uh, uh, the ACC live at Donington, and I was like, and I. Is that where he's like on the platform? Uh, yeah, the yeah, guitar yeah. player. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, and uh, I might have seen that. I think so. Yeah, I forget now. I, I don't quote me on that it's because like, like I'm like all over the place in this. <laughs> yeah, video I'm I mean, that could be that could be any one of them. <laughs> 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 but like, I just remember, you know, I my parents didn't really. I I, I knew some ACDC songs, but I, I one just being able to like see him and see him, you know doing all this crazy stuff and just also like really listening to that music i i was like oh this is so cool and and then i, I asked for a uh, guitar for christmas and then i just like got super into guitar and a couple and you know you once you start to get into something like guitar and you start talking to talking to your friends about it you find out oh this guy also plays guitar and then you know a couple of my friends and i were like oh well, let's let's jam you know yeah so then um and one of my friends was in marching band and um and i never thought i'd be in marching band <laughs> and he uh it was uh, this was ridiculous but he he's like come to the open house and and uh and you'll you'll, you'll, you'll play like key bass or something i was like all right and that's not really a marching band thing but so i went and i didn't think much of it and they're like yeah man you should you should really do this you sound great and i was like okay cool whatever so i showed up uh, to like their like first week of rehearsals or whatever um they sent me they're like oh lucas you're gonna be in the percussion with the percussion group i was like okay it's kind of whatever so i go to the percussion group and the the um the head of the percussion guys is he hands me some mallets and he takes me over the quads and he's like all right play this and just he, he's like he, he would play rhythm and i have to mimic him and we did like you know three he's like oh cool you're playing quads now. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> like I was going to play key bass. And now you have me playing Quad? drums. What is quads? Yeah. Uh, so it's it, like the four oh, okay. like, Tom yeah. kind of like drums, you know? Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, and yeah, man. And that was a, uh, wow. So you did drums first. Okay. Well, yeah. So I, so I, I kind of was a, you know, just a sort of did everything. The pit we did, I did some mallets. I did some, a little bit of snare drum, did bass drums, did the, did quads because we we didn't have a huge we were actually quite a, quite a small um marching band so like we uh we just like we just switch around instruments a lot and we just had to kind of cover whatever w wasn't being covered yeah um and a couple of my friends joined um a couple of people from we were we had a band going at the time we were like the one guy had been doing bands for like school band for a while he's like well, we could all join marching band like, cool and it was it was actually it was great it was a great experience for me and that actually, again, like, 
it, it helped me to like learn how to read music well because the thing also that uh, I, I as a piano like a, a lot of people sometimes when you play solo piano you don't adhere to rhythms as honestly as you think you are um because a lot of us don't like to practice with metronomes especially when we're kids yeah. so like i my my reading of rhythm was really not very good and then i played drums and i remember the 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 head guy would come up to me and be like lucas read me this rhythm and i just i couldn't and i was like what do you want me to say <laughs> he'd be like a one e a two you know yeah and I'd be like oh, okay and then so he actually gave me some like private lessons learning how to specifically read rhythms and um yeah man it was a really good growing experience and then that kind of put me on all, all those sort of experiences combined put me on a sort of path to to being like oh i really now like this a lot and then yeah. oh actually this is really something special so when you started playing keyboard again when you were in the marching band playing drums like i i never like didn't play keyboards but i i kind of went through phases of how much i like to play it i yeah. really didn't enjoy reading my i which made sense later on in life that i would go into jazz because i would always play classical stuff and just kind of i would i would tail off and start playing how I thought it was supposed to end and, and not how it's actually written. Yeah. And um, my teacher at the time said that I should take some jazz lessons. And probably my s- sophomore, junior year of high school, uh, I, one of the, the, uh, the students at Gettysburg College, um, where I'm from, Gettysburg, he, uh, my, my dad, uh, he was a student of my dad's. He was, he was a jazz player and the jazz piano player in the band and he gave me a couple of lessons, and I was like, "Oh, this is much more my speed." Yeah. You know? it's, it's sometimes you just have to find the sort of right avenue for you. Some people love classical music and they just want to read, and and that's great, and that's a specific kind of set of skill. And some people want to play in a metal band, and some people want to play jazz, and yeah, you know, you just have to kind of sometimes find what's your sort of lane. Yeah. So then, yeah, junior, senior, you, you started with the jazz lessons, and then uh, pr- probably probably earlier than that, like more like sophomore junior okay. year like sophomore year is really where I, I kind of like you know you're you're starting to kind of hit you know that sort of prime puberty and so like you're finding out that hey you're not gonna you know be six three and have a 40 inch vertical leap so you probably can't play <laughs> basketball you know so um so you kind of start finding out what you're what you're better at yeah and and then i just i i just sort of kind of coincided that i really found that love of music at the same time whereas like i just i i never disliked it but it like specifically playing keyboards was always a chore to me and then like i started when i started playing guitar and then i would take a couple of guitar lessons and i liked that because again like guitar it has it's a very different sort of way that you learn guitar you learn you start guitar by learning those like campfire chords and right and like yeah. songs immediately whereas like you go to most first piano lessons it's like here's your scale you know so, right yeah so which is something you know when I I try I think think about a lot when I'm teaching my students now I'm like again how do I how do I make this fun as well as like how do I how do I make this eight year old kid see the long term benefits of this you know yeah you know it's yeah it was I had a similar experience with the the classical and jazz I in college just as like as an elective I wasn't doing any kind of music program or anything but just as electives i was taking jazz and classical piano and guitar Mm -hmm. and i I, this the difference that you just mentioned was i had that same uh realization too like with the jazz lessons i'd be like ah this is like i can i can use this stuff immediately in the Mm -hmm. music that i'm making yeah uh whereas the classical there it's like because it was so long ago it's not quite as like applicable to modern styles which is funny to me man I mean, um that like because people sometimes don't realize that like beethoven and bach and those guys and mozart were like great great improvisers they were like just insane improvisers it's just it's just the way that classical music had to survive whereas like art forms like jazz had the benefit of being recorded so we could kind yeah. of you know hear w- how these guys improvised and, and whatnot you know, it, and it, I, I I see both sides of it because I, you know one of the benefits of of going to music school and, and doing jazz and classical was you kind of see both sides of the coin. Yeah. And is that what you did in mm-hmm. in Duquesne? 
Yeah, I did piano performance, and it was it was a uh, it was like two thirds jazz and one third classical. Um, the thing about the thing about uh, again the way you kind of like learned it was in jazz. You there's definitely certain tunes that are like harder as a tune overall. They might have harder chords or whatnot. But a lot of the a lot of the like repertoire you're playing like freshman year of jazz. You like learn you know autumn leaves and you know fly me to the moon and a lot of these kind of standards and you would play them still your senior year when you know you just learn all these new tricks oh, to kind okay. of apply to them whereas like when classical music right you here's this be, you know not beginner piece but here's this like yeah. freshman level piece and then you you know you're you're working up from like this like mozart sonata which is a little easier and then by the you know senior year you're hopefully working on like these big list pieces that are like insane you know that like you just didn't have the technique to do freshman yeah. year yeah it's an know. interesting point yeah you're 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 just going deeper into the uh the ideas with with the jazz i guess but you're not yeah doing as yeah it's like it's more like when you're when you're learning classical music it's like it's it's learning to read and you don't have the vocabulary yet to you, you don't even understand what a lot of the words are when you're reading this like these big big pieces you know maybe but um but like Jazz is more like learning how to write speeches on the fly. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> I don't know. Well, maybe that's a poor analogy, but it's it's just it's no, a different yeah. it's a def it's definitely a different way of. I mean, it's like reading versus writing or something. Yeah, you know, and and I, and and you know, I, I see a lot of that too in like the rock world and the you know in the bluegrass world. You know, I, I see a lot of the same kind of that sort of improvisatory sort of more learn by ear kind of world of music as opposed to the sort of like classical version of reading yeah. and not that not not to bash it all in classical music but um it's just a different sort of sense of how to play music they're so know? different it, it's really interesting to me how different like uh how certain people are so good at one of those things but not mm -hmm. at the other thing and they'd yeah. be like amazing at one of those two yeah kind of things you know yeah. reading reading verse improvising yeah kind of thing yeah and, and it's weird it i don't know if it's like a some people's brains are just wired a certain way or if it's just all of what they you know how they played music as they were learning yeah man i i, I know my uh uh one of my teachers mike tamaro who was the like uh ranging uh composing like j head of jazz at uh duquesne he uh he was saying he told me a story one time about how he he tried to do this big band concert of like with using all of the like great jazz musicians of Pittsburgh and a lot of them didn't really know how to read very well but they 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 were the most killing jazz players but they learned all by ear and just sort of by kind of like feel and um and he and he wrote all this big band music and they just they didn't they couldn't play it because they didn't know how to read very well but then he made recordings of the music and like they came back like two nights later we're like oh we learned all the music you know they, just, they could just learn it by ear that's so interesting yeah i mean uh, again like you said just different sort of they, they, they played at different parts of the brain i guess and there's different there's benefits to both because like something like piano where there's a lot of information you know sometimes in the, especially in those classical pieces there's just a lot of very specific things that are happening it'd be very hard to kind of be like okay well you know let's learn this little part you know yeah it, it's right. it, it lends itself better to you know reading yeah and, and it's also amazing when people can you know professional classical musicians you know they don't need to practice a piece they can just get something and be able to play it like yeah per perfectly yeah which is yeah man. you know that's pretty amazing yeah you know and the funny thing about classical music too for me is like classical music sometimes can be more like fulfilling because like you have this it's kind of like this puzzle and you practice this puzzle and you just you, you, you know you just kind of find where how where the pieces go and then you get to the last page and you play out the piece all the way through and then you feel like you have a very specific sense of accomplishment you're like i finished this piece whereas like sometimes you you know you go to a jazz jam session and you might play a solo and it might be terrible and you yeah. you get off stage and it's and you just you yeah. have to wait till the next time you get up on that stage or yeah know. there's a very like specific yeah it's like job completed yeah 
as it's supposed to be kind of thing. Like yeah. your, your work is, you know, defined yeah. when you have a written piece to play. Obviously you still have to, you know, you do the performance and you might, yeah. it might, 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 might not go as well as you'd like, but just as far as like, you have a very sort of specific kind of parameter of like, here's the beginning of the song, here's the end of the song. Whereas yeah. like sometimes, you know, you, you take a solo and a, and more of a improvisatory sort of music and, and it's just, it kind of, it comes and it might be as that super great, but it's like in a, it once it's done, it's it's over, you know. As yeah. opposed to maybe, you know, maybe you get it recorded, but it's never going to be kind of like as fulfilling necessarily as in that moment, you know. But yeah, that kind of. I I feel like I. I I appreciate those two, feelings with with performing like with the mm. with the band. Uh, like I, I I like, you know, improvising, doing improvised stuff, but you know, it, there's a risk of it, you know, not being yeah. structured enough and like going on for too long, or or maybe I can't think of anything cool to play in the moment. Yeah, well, composing on the spot, man. I mean, like, yeah, and and you know, the more and the, that's exactly it. Like you just you practice all these ideas and you and you practice it in real time, and again, you you, you can get better at it, but like. You know, we sit here and we hash out an idea. There's a different kind of process that comes out when you sit down and go, oh, not that melody. No, okay, let's do it again. Let me, that melody. Yeah. You know, and maybe you find a more perfect melody or maybe what you're really yeah. caring for. Mike and I talk about that a lot in the band that, like, you shouldn't listen to recordings of your solos, like, within 24 hours of you taking yeah. a solo <laughs> because cause you know what you were going for. Yeah. Like it, it's and it's it's really funny. I remember listening to a recording of my senior recital like the week after I'd finished it and I and I thought it was terrible because I I just I knew all the like spots of like I meant to go for this note as opposed to this note and whatnot. I listened back like a year later and I completely forgot, you know, all what I was specifically going for. And I was like, Oh, that wasn't that bad. You know? Yeah. Yeah, it's really yeah. interesting. Yeah, I've I've had similar experiences. We we record, you know, a lot of our jam sessions and shows and mm -hmm. and and some of our practices and yeah a lot of times I'll, I'll listen back later or you know right after the show i'll be like yeah i really don't know if how how that was yeah like i i have no idea or like i might have even you know felt not good about it mm -hmm. and then i'll listen to it you know after some time's passing I'll, mm -hmm. I'll usually be like encouraged like oh that was way better mm -hmm. than i thought it was going to be yeah listening back that being said it's also i think it's really good to record your live shows um that was something that clinton kind of got on to on to like a couple of years ago he's he just he wanted to start um recording all our live shows or as many as possible and then we would listen to them and sometimes we yeah. listen to them as a group and then like talk about it yeah because also sometimes sometimes you're not yeah. critical enough or, you, or, or you're doing something you didn't realize you exactly were doing, yeah you know, and so sometimes you think it went better in the moment, and then you kind of listen to it, <laughs> do it, and you're like, "Oh, that That's actually hard. sounded terrible." Oh, it's it's tough. That man. does it's happen a lot. Yeah, but yeah, I I agree. Yeah, we we definitely yeah. There's there's a lot of encouraging things, but there's definitely things that'll stick out. You know, that I won't have heard in the yeah. chaos of what it sounds like on stage when yeah. it's it's so loud and like yeah. can't hear yeah the best yeah well well and. And again, going back to that sort of like producer mentality of being holistic about it, like maybe, you know, in my mix, wherever, where it's mostly me, you know, coming from my monitor and I'm, I'm like, oh, my, my part, I'm playing my part great, but I'm not really listening to how my part fits with the guitar part or the horns, especially if yeah. like, the horns are on way on the other side of stage and they're just, they're not loud enough in, in my mix or whatever. I'm just like, you know, then I'd, I'd, I'm, I'm not really seeing how I might be playing my part perfectly, but my part doesn't fit well within the context of the whole song again. You know, yeah. so, so again, like listening to the, the recordings can do, can do a lot for you in that sense. You know, they really kind of, yeah, they, they put you out there because there's no really where, where there's nowhere to hide and you can't, it kind of like tells you, Oh, you were rushing. You were, you missed yeah. that note. It, yeah. You know, rushing or yeah, I've noticed if it's a really loud uh, stage, mm. uh, or like I, I can't, yeah, if the volume of the stage is really loud, I've noticed I would have a tendency to change the way I'm playing to, yeah. to 
where in reality, like out front, it sounded balanced, but where I was standing on the stage, I felt like I needed to play louder. And then I was, you could hear it. I was playing too loud. I was like over bending yeah. notes sure. and like playing with too much, uh, saturation. Yeah. yeah. That kind of stuff. Yeah. But wouldn't have, yeah, all this kind of stuff that you won't see when you're doing it. But overall, it's it's usually been like, I guess I'm lucky because I'm like, some people are very unsatisfied always with yeah <laughs> with uh, what they get. I fall into that category. You know, I'm like, I, give me another 20 takes. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> but usually it's pretty encouraging. Like, I would be satisfied if I was an audience member. Yeah. Well, that, that's the thing too, man. That um, one thing that I think Clinton re- and again Jeremy, are, you know, was really good at it was telling. It, Clinton's very good at telling us when something feels good. Clinton isn't necessarily. He doesn't have a lot of background in sort of the in musical sort of education. Like he doesn't. He doesn't know a ton of theory. He doesn't know like all the sort of verbiage, which you, you, he which he hasn't been really that much of a crutch for him. It, it's, it's not really a big deal that he doesn't know because he has a really good sense of when something feels good. And then he he, he has uh, enough humility to kind of be able to turn to people who, like Anton or Minda or myself, and, be, and who might have that more, you know, we, we know all the fun chords and whatnot. That yeah. We just kind of find what he's right. feeling or hearing, you know. And, um, you know, so he has a really good sense of like that felt good, you know? Yeah. And, and I think the, the, the best sort of marker is, is the audience too. Like, and which can also be deceptive because maybe they're, maybe they're drunk or whatnot and they don't really know what's going on. But, but, but also like I, sometimes we have nights on tour where maybe you come off stage and you're like, Oh, that was terrible. But then like somebody comes up to you at the merch and they're like, that was incredible. I loved it so much. And, you know, I'm I'm a new fan and whatnot, and yeah, and I want to buy your record and whatnot. I mean, that that's more important to me, anyways, than like, oh well, I didn't hit that super cool arpeggio, yeah, you know, my solo, you know. <laughs> yeah, sometimes it can be hard to let that go because there have been times when when I've felt like that getting off stage. You know, that same exact scenario happens where I'm like, ah, like I'm kind of feeling bummed about hmm. how it went for me, and then uh, you know, as the stuff that I was playing at least, and then. Hmm. Uh, yeah, and then someone will have like a, a nice compliment to say, uh, and I'll be like su- surprised, kind of. Yeah. Be like, sometimes it's hard for me to accept. Be like, yeah. nah, I, I blew it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I blew it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A, it's a tough. Thank you, though. Yeah, it's a tough line to to walk, man, because you know you you want to you especially for us who are who are very critical of our own playing. It's it's tough to take compliments, and then but but you also need to if if you've. Yeah, like if you feel like you left something uh, left something on the table or something. Yeah, you know, I mean, again, like being your own worst critic, it's a it's a really good and bad thing. It's just like yeah. you, it helps you get better. You know, that that was a good thing in music school. You know, just like you know, you're like I can do better, I can do better, and you practice and you practice and you try to you know learn as much as you can. But at the same time, sometimes you do something right and you just need somebody to come along and be like, hey. That was good. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, ultimately, uh, it's, it really is just, you know, should be, should be fun and enjoyable. Yeah. You know, for that's, sure. that's the reason, you know, I would want to keep doing it. Yeah. I mean, you have to ask yourself, what, what, what's the, what's the reason you're, you're playing the music? Is it so that, is it for you or for the audience? I mean, um, obviously. That's a good question. Yeah. Well, obviously, I mean, obviously, I mean, or, I guess it's for the audience, really. I mean, there's it's a I guess there's faders, you know. Sometimes yeah. this this song's a little more for me, and this song's a little more <laughs> yeah. for the audience, you know. But, yeah. Um, because yeah, you, it's yeah, yeah. I was I was listening to a podcast with the uh, the founder of CD Baby. Are you f- familiar with that website? I mean, I'm familiar with it. Yeah, I don't know who the. That's founder just is. like how, how I get my music onto sure digital streaming things, but. Derek Sivers, he's the the founder, and he was mm. he was on the Tim Ferriss show. Okay, and he was talking about uh, realizing at one point, or like concluding at one point that because he was he was performing a lot, and he said one of the biggest realizations he had was that you know it wasn't about him when he's performing; it's about the audience and their yeah. experience. Yeah, 
and I guess I, I hadn't thought about that that much, and it, it really is, but I, I get the fader thing, too, like, the audience, you know, if they're fans of your music, yeah. you know, that's, they're fans of what you, what you like to do. Yeah. So, if you cater too much to what you think other people want you to do, then, yeah. then that, that probably could get, get you lost. It's a balance of, like, doing doing what's you and then people kind of naturally come to what you do but also like if you if you don't think at all of like how your audience is responding to it well like then don't be upset when nobody's at your shows like yeah <laughs> like, right you know if you if you're if you're i mean i mean then that can be yeah you know you just you maybe don't think enough about like oh well, well I'm, i, I want to take a 20 minute keyboard <laughs> solo well that doesn't really make for easy listening always yeah you know, or even particularly enjoyable listening you know yeah, yeah. But it, it's not a it's not a perfect equation not fader so. the fader you need it's you a need fader enough, man it's a fader you, you got to make sure you're, you're doing enough to keep yourself engaged yeah you gotta you gotta, you gotta know you, you gotta know your your audience man like if you're if you're if you're at a jazz concert you know people are coming to hear you because you're a jazz artist and that's exactly what they want to hear but like if you're you know at a if you're playing in a pop band you know people yeah. want to hear songs you know right. so it's part of part of it is just kind of recognizing what is your audience you know once once you do that kind of thing like you you learn what you like to do you know as you're saying you, you kind of find what your vibe is what what is your kind of music you find out what people come to see that music you know then you kind of you know you kind of again trim down the fat yeah and find, kind of tailor it to that yeah a little bit you know i think um you know because certain things work for, like for, for, for us as a band certain things work for us that wouldn't work for other people you know yeah we can go on certain we can open up for certain bands and we can not open for other bands you know because the audience isn't going to react the same you know and like maybe we go on this certain radio show and, it, and we do really well and another band you know does crazy you know jazz stuff it won't work as well to that demographic that's more interested in hard rock soul music which is much more towards what we do you know yeah so you know i mean like probably your music wouldn't necessarily appeal to our demographic the same way and vice versa you know yeah for sure it's uh it's good to be in front of the the, the people that want to you know are are you know, interested in what you're doing yeah because it, there's definitely been some, yeah, there, there's been a few shows where it's kind of just like not, not landing or just not like, a, yeah. it's like a background thing. It's just like, yeah. feels like not really making an impact. Yeah. yeah Thankfully I mean, not, not many of those shows at all, but. Yeah, man. When we, we picked a, picked a tough industry. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, 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 it's so unblack and non-black and white you know so much of what we're saying is could also be very easily wrong you know or, or is wrong you know <laughs> yeah it depends just depend, sort of depends on what kind of music you play again what do you want out of music do you i mean for for me like music is a communal thing you know uh, there are certain things that like if i'm just in my room playing on my piano like okay like that that's for me but like when, when we're going and playing a, a live show you know that's about you know communicating with the audience it's not so much about just what what i like just exploring your own yeah you know world yeah exactly so you know it but i think you know i th i i like mu music as a communal thing i think there's a lot of I mean, historically i think that's more what it's been about you know yeah. so I and mean, that's a that's as old as humans yeah just right. communal music yeah you know, you know i mean and you know, I, th I think what we we've succeeded really well off of is is that people like to come see us live. You know, like that that because there's an energy. I think people coming to see are coming to see live music so much more these days because they just they they want that that communal sense. They want that like live energy that like you don't you can't the best record won't give you that that sense yeah. of being at a show. You know, when the bass is so loud that it it like feels like your heart's about to fall out of your chest yeah, yeah. it's definitely yeah different when you can physically feel the uh energy of the group yeah like 
and, and what they're doing. That's yeah, man, we, you know, we, we talk about it a bunch, you know, too, when, we talk, when we're trying to find what songs we should play for this radio spot or what songs we should play for a live show or whatnot. Certain songs we'll think are going to be awesome live and, they just, and they're just not, you know. But, but, but when they're on the record, maybe they're just, that's the perfect song for, you know, maybe when you're driving at 12 o'clock at night, you know. Yeah. You, just want that chill song that's the song for you but you you know but when you go and you play it in front of a festival crowd who's all amped up and they want that live energy that's not the song you know right so yeah that's where the fader comes in play like it's all faders man. you might really want to play that song that's not gonna be necessarily the best thing for the situation but yeah if you're if you're not, if you're not thinking about the how much the crowd's gonna enjoy it Oh, and that's something we talk about all the time too, man. Just it, it, it is also your favorite songs versus the crowd's favorite songs, you know. And that's a that's a tale as old as time. I've, you know, Billy Joel talks all the time about how Piano Man's like his least favorite song, <laughs> but it's, it's it's everybody else's favorite song. Yeah. So he has to play it all the time, but he doesn't like it. Um, you know, I he saw, doesn't like it at all. Um, I mean, I I don't know how much maybe he not actually anymore. I mean, maybe not anymore. He's played it so much. You no, know, or like I saw. A, I think it was that Hot Ones interview of John Mayer, and he was, um, and he was talking about how he uh, the same thing he says like some of his songs that he he thought were going to be the hits people don't like, and the songs that he thought were nothing, yeah, you know. So so he's, he 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 kind of says that same thing that balance of like this song is for me and this song's for you. And, yeah, you know, some people will really like this one. And have, some people yeah. have you guys found that like you guys have favorites as a band that oh that yeah don't don't seem to do as well as other ones that you <laughs> might not like as much oh we talk about it all the time and sometimes we we have to take a step back and be like do we not want to play this song because we're tired of playing it or because we think it actually won't go over well yeah you know and that's really hard man and i don't necessarily know what the answer is right because you, you, yeah you gotta you know take care of your own interest and like how much fun you're having well that's and that's contagious exactly and that, that's that's the that's the one side of the coin that that people will argue in our band they'll say if if we're not vibing well with the song then people aren't gonna are gonna realize that we're not vibing with it and so they're not gonna enjoy it but at the same time like you sometimes have to play the the hits you know sometimes you have to play piano man even if you really don't like it you know and maybe maybe that's just performing maybe performing is acting like you are enjoying playing whatever you you are you know i mean does does billy joel go out every night and play piano man and actually en- enjoy it or is he just really good at acting like he enjoys it you know and the same is true i think of most you know artists you know maybe maybe when i went to see john Mayer and he played slow dancing in a burning room maybe he was thinking this is the most the worst song of all time it's so overplayed and i'm and i'm over there having just this like transcendental experience where i'm like this is the best thing of all time and he's just absolutely brain you know you know i think when i've thought about that I feel like I would have to shift my thinking to not be thinking about my enjoyment, but like if you were focusing, like if the crowd, if it was really true and the crowd loves this one song, they yeah. can, if you were focusing on the crowd and yeah. not you, and you were just playing the song and watching people like really enjoying yeah. themselves yeah. to this, like that could, I could see that being fulfilling. Like uh, maybe I don't like this song, but like all these people, they love it. Like they are going crazy yeah. that, I'm playing this song. Which, yeah, man. It's like it's I'm a, not on that level of having to deal with that, but like, yeah. sure. And I mean, I'm not saying that we necessarily are, but we we we've been lucky enough to have a decent amount of success, and people, you know, come to our shows and do and have been listening to the record outside of the show, obviously. And um, you know, they definitely have songs they want to hear, and sometimes like we're just wow, we really don't want to play that song because yeah. we, we played it so much, or we're just really not vibing well with yeah. it so you know it's it's tough and i think you know again it, 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 in the event that you do have a hit or something that is a crowd favorite you know you uh if you go and play then you have then you have to act like you you like it you know and yeah i think that I, I do think that's a that's a pretty key part of performing you know just especially when you're out for for a long period of time you know you you play the same songs over and over again. You have to act the first night and the last night as if you like the songs. You know, you have to you you have to go out. You can't be putting out a like you don't want to be doing this. Yeah, vibe. <laughs> people get that, man. And, and people people can read that. And I and then sometimes you you know have to 
slap myself in the face mid set, you know, because I'm like, I'm not braining it as hard as I need to be. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I think that's part of it. I think about that stuff a lot, and I, I feel like there's got to be ways to kind of change the perspective on the experience to to be able to somehow like if you could just somehow like cultivate a an actual genuine feeling of like enjoying that moment yeah for whatever reasons you know that's a very it's a, that's a very artistic way to think about it. like just oh it's always to be genuine but enjoyment like, of you know so you don't have to act like so yeah, you can, yeah no, i get it and like uh i've noticed it in times when i'm playing a show you know, sometimes I get that if it's a song we've played a whole bunch, like sometimes I'll almost get self-conscious, like, man, we've played this song a lot. Yeah. Like, are people like tired of this song? Yeah. Yeah. But, but you have uh, to sometimes take that step back and be like, well, I mean, maybe everybody doesn't, you know, hasn't heard this song so many times. Yeah. But then, you know, I, I always, I notice like if I look up, like mm. a lot of times I'm looking down and stuff, mm. but if I look up and I like see, but it, I always end up like smiling if I look up and I see somebody doing something funny or like dancing or like yeah. if I just like look around and like get out of my head of like playing the song, yeah. it, it really does lift my lift my energy. Oh, for sure, man. I, I say all, all the time that uh, Common Heart is a funny band and that our, our, we play our best when the pressure is on the most, which I can't say for every other band I've been in, you know. Sometimes you you know you get the pressure's on and you get sloppy or you just get so nervous you're making lots of mistakes. One of the good things about Common Heart is we, when we're in high pressure situations, we really have to bring it. Uh, people step up. Like yeah, M- Mindo just... feeds off the crowd. Clinton feeds off the crowd. It's a um, cool feeling. It is, but the the opposite side of that is that sometimes when when there's <laughs> not as many people, yeah, we we don't do as good a job of kicking ourselves in the when butt. When you're playing the Miami Dolphins, yeah, ex- exactly, <laughs> yeah, I mean, but, but that's exactly it, isn't it? It's, it's the the Steelers, man. It's like somehow when it's the Patriots, they make it interesting. Well, not always, but like yeah. <laughs> not this time. No, I know what you mean. Yeah, but, but, but like, but sometimes, uh, you know, it's when it's when when you feel like you have to play really well, you. You do, and then sometimes yeah. you think it's the easy one. You you don't do it. You, you right need to, step to be it able to, to get that same same mindset when it's a less a less lower impact show. Or yeah, something. yeah. No, but but good good problems to have sometimes. You know. Yeah, <laughs> it's a good problem to have that you need to that 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 you're good when you need to be good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's really interesting. Uh, I talk about this with. My brother and the other people in our band, uh, there's a very noticeable effect of like when a show's coming up, especially if, particularly if it's a, a you know a bigger show, mm-hmm. that you know our practices might not be going so well leading up to it. Mm-hmm. But then like as the show, the closer the show gets, like usually mm-hmm. like the week of the show, like everybody kind of feels the gravity of it or something, and like yeah. uh, everybody gets on top of what they have to do and then like at the show everybody's just focused on you know a much higher level than when we're practicing or something yeah. when everybody's you know looking at you mm-hmm. and playing it's mm. it's really nice feeling actually to like i've noticed a lot of time if we're playing a song that we haven't practiced much and like i was a little shaky on in practice and maybe didn't know all the changes as well as i should Mm-hmm. at a show i'll be like on another a little higher level of focus so like i'll know yeah, what's going to happen for sure before it happens more in advance than i do at practice yeah i, I remember clinton kind of talking about that sometimes that he he would joke that if the if like we have a big show coming up the re- if the rehearsal before it went well that was not a good thing because then people were to be overconfident going in. <laughs> when the when the rehearsal is bad going into the show then the show is going to be good because people are going to go home and they're going to be, be like oh yeah they're, they're going to know they need to practice they're going to know they're going to need to be yeah. on that's funny on it, because you know? like that has happened a lot for us where like the practice before will be like ew that didn't feel so good yeah, yeah. <laughs> but then the show is good yeah and then yeah. the show goes fine yeah because you need to because everybody kind of steps up you know? yeah overconfidence is real because <laughs> you know you, you get sloppy sometimes you you know I'll find that too, you know, sometimes you, when you, when you start, I'll be like really focused at the beginning and then it starts, it goes, it's going really well. And then I kind of go on cruise control cause I'm like confident, I'm like, oh, this is going great. And yeah. then like, then I just 
out of nowhere hit the totally wrong chord. <laughs> Everybody looks around at me like, the, I'm like, all right, my bad. And then, then it's back in, you know. You know yeah. I'm, it's kind of, yeah. I've noticed with shows too, like if the show's going well mm. and, and like there's a lot of energy and stuff, mm. I feel a lot more lenient towards myself with little mistakes. Sure, a, sure. In terms of like, I can let the ones go a lot easier that probably only the other members of the band are going to know. Sure. Or maybe if there was yeah. somebody who was, you know, had a really good ear in the audience or something yeah. or knew the music really well. You know, big picture things, I guess, you know, again, I think it's important to see how the audience is reacting or kind of gauge those things of like, what is the, what would the audience actually know? Does the audience recognize always when you, when you're a little, maybe your part is a really small rhythm part that's not even up front in the mix and maybe you hit one chord just a little out of time. That's not a big deal in the context of it all. You yeah. Know? But ultimately, yeah, I, I, I try to remember that the vibe like the feel is is that's more important yeah than the execution if you're you know a perfectly executed set with mm. with no energy or or like where i'm like robotic visibly anxious yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> is not as good as like a sloppier set where i'm like loose and having a good time yeah man no i mean for sure i'm i mean especially if, again I'm, it, when you're comparing live versus recording I yeah. mean, recordings where you go and to perfect everything and and live is where you want to have that that energy and if there's no energy if you're not having a good time you know that you have you better have a good record to back that up you know because like yeah you know may, maybe if you have this really great record where you're like real shredding whatever and you can just kind of stand there and shred that's what people are going there to see you but like when in the context of us you know or you know why, why? Why do pop bands have all these dancers and whatnot? Because you, you, when you go to a live show, they want you want to see all the pomp and circumstance. Yeah, you know, the but. energy. Yeah, that's that's what I got. I always have to remind myself of that. If I'm ever feeling anxious or n- not confident or nervous or something before mm-hmm. a show, like that's that's going to be very counterproductive. Like just let that stuff go and like try and have a good time. Yeah, man. Yeah, no, it's it's going to come out if <laughs> you're you know bugging out well and I've, I've seen i've seen it with clinton firsthand like oh, one of the i mean one of the main things they they don't come people don't come up and compliment him on you know just like how perfect his voice is and they come up and they, they they love the the soul of his voice and they love that like he that he just leaves it all on the floor you know he just he's falling on stage he's he he's visibly passionate, and that's what people resp- respond to. Yeah. You know that he has yeah he has a, he has a distinctive voice, and and maybe it's that we we execute the music really well, but it's it's also that like they get that sense of passion from him, and yeah. people I think you know they come up to him, and they say, you know I just loved your your set because it was so heartfelt, it was so soul, soulful. You know yeah, so, I mean that's that was my impression uh, when I saw you guys for the first time. Mm. 2016 Farm Jam Yeah how, well, how long had you been playing there In the band for that Not long man Not long Probably probably less than a year by that point And what's funny was I remember you, you sent me you, you, you texted me You sent me that Facebook message Saying that you had really enjoyed our set and, I, and along these lines I remember thinking that I played so badly Really? I remember, I remember Oh my god No I remember thinking I remember thinking Again off the stage I was like Oh that was I played so badly that set And you sent me a message You were like Oh man that was absolutely killing I'm like Cool yeah, Good to know, you know? That's, so, that's so funny Because that was like You're Yeah you're playing Like I feel like you did a lot of lead stuff During that set or, I don't or also like you remember were, I just remember thinking it was bad. <laughs> it, like it, it really like blew me away, completely. Oh well, uh, thanks, man. Yeah, the whole set, the whole thing. But you know, your your playing in particular just like stuck out to me. Uh, bad mix, man. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny that you that you didn't feel good about that show. No, it's a perfect example of what we're talking about, man. It's like, like one of the best shows I've ever seen. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. I I just remember. That being just like crazy because like you know just with so many of us like I think we were like stuck behind some some of us were stuck behind like the poles we couldn't really yeah. see each other well I don't think they had enough monitors for all of us so like a couple of us were sharing monitors and and I think Minda was having like 
guitar problems. I don't, I, I don't remember That's everything. So funny. But I just remember thinking that like, again, the like the energy was great. But I, I remember thinking I, I played poorly. I remember thinking it was bad. And, I, and then I got your message, and I was like, <laughs> all right, did something right, but. That's you know, funny. It's a, it's a it's a perfect example, I guess. Of yeah. Exactly what we're talking about. <laughs> Sometimes you need that third party. <laughs> yeah, to kind of get the get the whole picture. Yeah. Out of the micro micro world. I m- I miss that festival, man. It's 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 uh, one of the unfortunate side effects of kind of getting more successful. Is you don't necessarily get to play those those like cool little yeah you know homegrown things as much. You know that one's sweet. Yeah, I definitely. I, we played a ton of those this this past year. Yeah, like Farm Jam, but then there's also Larry Palooza, mm-hmm. Gare Fest, Grooving with the Grove. Uh, yeah, there might have been another one. So all, all these uh, similar kind of thing, just a very yeah. grassroots type thing. Those yeah. are, those are fun. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't mean to sound like pretentious about that. no no like, no, no. <laughs> you I know, mean, with success and i just like it, it's the your schedule gets you have a lot more things contending for your time well and also that we personally as a band have less sort of control over dictating what we want to play and what we don't want to play it's much more decided by like it's not decided by our management and our booking agent but it's kind of like they'll say you need to do this you shouldn't do this this isn't good for your Okay, you know, yeah, your, your image or whatever. Target you know. your target your performances. Yeah, you know that like this is Madison House uh, is our Madison House, and w- in conjunction with Opus One is our is our okay. um, is our Manage- management and our booking agency is Paradigm. Wait um, a minute, what is Madison House? So how does that fit in? What, what, uh, well, Madison Madison House is like the is based in Boulder, and their their management. They're they are management, and so we have this kind of. They're your they're your management. They are our management, but then a, a branch of Madison House is Opus One. Oh, they are. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly. Don't don't, don't don't call me on yeah, this. Yeah, I'm, I'm just trying definitely. to like put together how management booking agents, <laughs> yeah. like how this all works with the band, because like I have no idea. Yeah, so I mean, um, I'm definitely not the person to talk to about this. Yeah. You know? <laughs> but like, or what just I've observed, kind of from Clinton and. Being being around it is that uh, Madison House is they they're pretty big. They manage a bunch of of bands. I think they manage like you know like String Cheese and yeah. like those kind of people. Yeah, I've, I've looked at their their roster. Yeah, it's a it's a pretty it's pretty impressive. But then like Opus One is like our direct management. Um, that's like our day to day people. And I th- I I don't know if you necessarily consider them a specifically a branch of Madison House or if they are just like. A, in conjunction with Madison House or whatever, but yeah, like, but we're we're also managed by Madison House. I guess you could think mainly. My sort of general observation of it is that Madison House just kind of does our big picture stuff, and like Opus does more of like our day to day stuff. But maybe I'm interpreting. And then Paradigm handles all the booking. Does all the booking, and they yeah. work closely with Opus One, and they yeah they it's it's all you know one big team at this point. They all kind of communicate together. Paradigm will book our places and the places that they think are best for us and that's sort of you know done through with communication to our yeah. management whatnot. so then what does management do other you know if, oh, well, if you yeah. have a booking agent <laughs> doing the booking um i mean they do a lot of different things they, they again i think the one of the best things they do is they definitely are that third party again in a, yeah. in a different sense of like t- they, they direct you and do what shows you should be playing, where you should be playing, kind of like your, your, you know, they help you with merch and, you know, images, you know, like like how you want to do your social media, how you, like, okay. they, they help again with that sort of big picture stuff. Yeah. Um, and they also have, like, they have the connections, too, you know. Right, um, yeah, with all the venues and other management and booking yeah, agents. Yeah, you know, and they, they, the web. well, and, like, when we, when we signed this record deal, like, that was facilitated by the you know, management, you know, so that, that, that kind of stuff that they're, you know, you could, I, I, again, I don't profess to know all the ins and outs of everything they do for yeah. us, but like, I've definitely seen the benefits of, of, of having them on, like how, what the band was like before and after they come. Right. You know, just that they, 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 they have these connections to paradigm yeah. and to, um, you know, these different labels and so like, 
how is it working? How is it working with 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 them? Like how much how much uh, flexibility do you have? Or like is it is it like a pressuring situation? Like is it do you feel pressure from that from the management? Yeah, I mean, because there's a lot of trust involved with mm. you know trusting them to you know just trusting the decisions that they're mm -hmm. suggesting to you. Yeah, the well, suggestions they make. So and so this is something that I. I've kind of advised some of my, some people that I've seen that are kind of like on the cusp of getting management or booking agents is that uh, are that you want when whenever you strike a deal you with these people you want with management and booking you want uh, kind of percentage deals right where they take a percentage of your earnings not where you pay like a right. salary you know or mm -hmm. like a monthly subscription wage kind of thing because that doesn't incentivize them to work at all for you whereas like if you if your booking agent takes you know 20 percent of whatever your gig is well like 20 percent of 100 bucks isn't very much but like if you yeah. make you know if the gig is ten thousand dollars then then that's interesting to them as well and right. the same thing with management you know so like you want i think those deals are much more where you want to be going for something that's yeah. going to incentivize them to to work for you as well you know what I mean? Right. I just think when you hear those like those deals that are are going badly, it's so, so, or some of those deals, anyways. You know, where people feel like, oh, I got a booking agent, but it's not really doing anything for me. Well, you pay 150 bucks a month, and they're they're just gonna throw you a kind of one or two BS gigs, and that's not really doing anything for anybody. Yeah. But they don't really have any incentive to 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 work better for, because if you if you get this big gig. You're still paying them 150 bucks, you know, so that seems to be a a good system to have. When yeah, that seems to be more beneficial to us, and especially. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. Does it ever get complicated with the amount that they want you to do? Maybe being or or the things they want you to do, maybe being things that you don't necessarily want to do that much, but you know that the mm. the incentive of the of the show payment, mm. you know. Well, so I, the thing I should also preface this all with is that I have the sort of the n luxury of not being the person who has to directly work with them. Like, you know, yeah. in, in the sense that, like, the pressure's not on me, you know, that Clinton has to make these decisions. And that's for better or for worse. So when I, I can be frustrated, maybe that I'm like, I want the band to do this and I want the band to do this and I think we should be doing this and not and whatnot. But it's not, that's not my decision to make. It's really a conversation between him and the the management and whatnot and so like he can come to us as a band and and kind of take input but like at the end of the day he's I think he's really the the president if you will you know i think it's, it's 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 his decision making but i think you know they've been very there i i don't think we haven't felt a lot of pressure to be like something we're not which i definitely okay. know is That's something good. something people worry about a lot when taking on management and labels but i think unless you're like signed to a really big label like atlantic you know it's not gonna that's yeah. not really the case it's it, it's definitely you know it's a give and take when you the record labels that are gonna tell you to do more they're probably also gonna invest in you more you know so they might give you a whole lot more money and so they want more control you yeah know? whereas like these labels that might not or management or whatever that are gonna give you much more free reign aren't necessarily gonna give you as much money either but you know it's a it's a return on investment kind of thing. Yeah. I think my worry would be doing too much shows. <laughs> D doing too much shows? Yeah. Why would that be a problem? Just because, just the traveling or because you think it like would be... Like, feeling out of control of how much I'm playing mm -hmm. and and getting over overworked with the shows. Mm -hmm. I guess that's the worry. But I guess ultimately, you know... It's up to you. It's up to you. I mean, yeah, like, like Clinton can say well, we're not going to play that show, you know, especially like if we have a, like, for example, when Mike got married, we 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 didn't, it wasn't like, oh, you know, we're going to take the show over Mike's wedding. Like, no, we, he, he definitely still has the ability to be like, no, we're not going to do that. But you, you have to trust that, that, you know, unless you're working with somebody really sleazy, in which case you wouldn't, shouldn't be working with them, you have to trust that they're, they're kind of, they're trying to do what's best yeah, for, for, for your band, yeah. Yeah, you know. And, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, for sure. Also, if, 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 you if you trust that they're really, that they, they want to, 
for everyone to succeed, then especially if they're if somebody like Madison House who knows what they're doing, they, they have the the street cred. You know, they have all these bands that they've driven to success. You know, why why would I not trust them? You know, necessarily. Yeah. You know, you know, I, I they they have a formula and and if 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 I don't like that, okay, I have to go and do this month of touring. Well, then maybe this isn't right the gig for you you know for people, yeah <laughs> and and then that, that's a that's a hard conversation man i mean like touring is definitely not for everybody it's really hard you know it's yeah. hard especially you, you like everybody in common hearts like either married or in significant in pretty established relationships and so it's hard you know because we we leave loved ones you yeah know? so that, that's a, that's definitely a hard hard thing but you know it's always encouraging when i hear about bands who you know, are very successful, but also seem to have balanced uh, home lives. Yeah, I mean, I mean again, well, kids, wives, a lot of some bands don't even live in the same city. Yeah, Wolf, Wolfpack, they don't live in the same city. Yeah, no, I mean, and and uh, Freeze, they don't live in the same city. A lot, a lot of a lot of these bands, you know, once you get to a a a sort of comfortable place, you you know, then maybe they don't necessarily even have to rehearse you know they they get together to you know we're gonna go tour and okay we're gonna meet in this city and then we're gonna go from that city and then we'll, we'll all fly back i mean jj's band is like that when we, we toured at mofro like the bass player lives in fort collins and uh the bunch of them live in jacksonville and this guy lives in this place you know they don't i mean so everybody they, just shows up and they know what they, they, up they know what they're supposed to do yeah they, i mean they you know they you have know their, their stuff yeah and maybe they maybe they meet up for a rehearsal or yeah. something or he has a specific idea maybe he sends it out or or whatnot um and if they're writing you know but like it, they might go to a studio and they have to have, mm-hmm. have a specific writing session but that's the, the same thing okay we're gonna all fly into jacksonville and we're all gonna work on the record and work on arrangements you know yeah but yeah i mean we obviously don't have that luxury yet but it's a place we'd like to be i, I would i kind of low-key predict that once we would get to that spot a bunch of us would move to a bunch of different places <laughs> oh I mean, yeah yeah i mean just just from gauging what we talk about on tour just i think everybody like be, we all love in, uh, portland maybe <laughs> i've never seattle well seattle's too expensive but like i you know every time we go out to colorado or to montana like people are always like oh bozeman's awesome and yeah denver and boulder are great you know so i think you know i i wouldn't be surprised if people well, once that luxury presented itself would would immediately be like, yeah. not immediately like, that's, yeah that's 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 encouraging you know you, you can that you know these bands can just they can do that and yeah. it still works yeah well it would be i mean i don't know i don't know if we'd ever get to that you know but we we hope to you know yeah um and you know maybe, maybe talk to talk to me again in five ten years and see it. yeah <laughs> see, see where <laughs> you're at it's easy maybe maybe it's like oh yeah it's all working now and then five ten years from now all of us are just broken shells of ourselves <laughs> <laughs> all just terrible home lives <laughs> uh, that's what i'm trying to avoid yeah I don't me too become man. A shell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah no i mean it, it but we uh you know we have very supportive um families as well that are which were that's super important. super important as well because it wouldn't it wouldn't work otherwise you know yeah but it's it's tough man being i mean i i I, I know a whole lot of people who are better performers than I, and better, they're great, great performers who, are like not interested at all in touring, and I and I totally get it. I don't blame them at all because they, you know, they just they want to be in one place. They want to be around their family. They want to, you know, not share one hotel room with four other people and yeah, just have <laughs> you a, know. just have a more centered uh, lifestyle, I guess. Yeah, man. I mean, the thing. The thing that uh, about tour life is it's there's there's really no privacy and there's not a lot of like personal space. You'll kind of you'll you'll see that occasionally that like sometimes like one of us will be like I just need to, I'm just gonna go to a coffee shop. Oh, you want me to come with you? No, no, I'm just gonna I'm you know yeah. Just I'm gonna go I'm gonna go to the Target and buy some shoes or whatever. You know, yeah, it's like I, I can totally get that. Yeah, just because people just need their space. You know, yeah. and because like yeah, we when you're here you know you're at home you go home and you watch your netflix and you're on your couch with you know your significant other and it's great and you have your own space and 
when I, you just don't necessarily get that on tour. You're in the van, and then you're at the gig, and you're at dinner, and you're yeah. you're always together. So you've got to yeah make some time to get, get to know some, each other. <laughs> yeah. Also, yeah, yeah, be able to. I, I yeah, I would I would probably need that just to, yeah. some moments alone. Yeah, you just you just need like yeah, just you know something and people it manifests itself in different ways for everybody you know so, oh, i'm just gonna go for a walk around this town or i'm just gonna go and get a burger by myself or i'm gonna go work out and put my headphones in and it's just you know yeah I think, I think the other other thing that just about everybody in the band is purchased or in the process of purchasing is is a uh, noise canceling headphones for this exact reason <laughs> oh, yeah. so like well at least i mean i think at least three of us now have them and maybe maybe more because we just like man when you're in the van and like you i i remember clinton telling me that he he because he he had them for a while he and sean had them and he was talking about how he would put them on and then like put on music and put like his hood on and just and it would be like his kind of like private time of just like being able to not have to deal with all of just the noise and then i was, and I was like oh that sounds cool and i and then my mom asked me what i wanted for my birthday uh, over the summer and I was like I couldn't think of anything I was like maybe noise canceling headphones and then like it's been a game changer man. <laughs> it's been nice it's been nice it, it, I, I totally get it it's like it's like you can just you just put them on you put on whatever music you want to listen to or white noise or whatever and it's just it, it can it can give you some of that sort of just clear mental space you know, yeah it's the feeling of space yeah that that and, and working out for me I, 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 are like my times where I just try to go and like just outlets yeah. yeah just you need again you need those those mental breathers sometimes from just the all the stressors but, yeah yeah but again I, I i i don't i don't hold it against anybody who like who who would like who doesn't want to go on tour you know yeah i think sometimes people are like you're so good you should you know you should you why aren't you touring why aren't you a professional performer all the time it's like that's not what they're about. That's not what yeah, they want to do. Some people don't want that. Yeah. No. Yeah. I, I'm under. Yeah. I'm understanding that more. Mm. Yeah. It's a. It's. It's a very distinct way of living. It seems like and, and yeah. making a living. Well, I think it's also like this sort of stigma that of like if you don't perform music, that it that you're not like a real musician. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I think right. I think that's like a subconscious thing that a lot of people have that like the only way you've really made it in music you're only really a successful musician if you're a performer if you and and what's more is if you perform your own songs yeah you know your own original music which i think is is ridiculous i think there's a lot of different ways to be successful as far as yeah. being a musician is being I'm, a teacher is super important being a church organist is super important being you know just you know whatever it is for you playing wedding bands, so, you know, like that, that's all different facets of music. And some people are really good at one thing and really bad at the other, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, I definitely had that, that thought for a while when I was first starting music, like, mm. Oh, if you're like touring, then that means like, you made it. Yeah. Yeah. Per, so to bring a full circle, I don't know if tour was successful. <laughs> oh yeah. No, 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 I'm, I'm just, I'm, no. I just, I'm, I'm saying like, you know, what is, what, you know, what is success? You know, be real. <laughs> yeah, but, I know but, that's a hard question to answer. It's something I'm always trying to figure out. Like, what do I actually, what, what is it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Like um, f failure is me not enjoying doing music. Exactly. So yeah. And that's good because that's not happening. Well, that's going to be different <laughs> for every person, you know. If yeah. if you're not going to be happy unless you're performing music, well, okay, well then that maybe maybe that is your 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 failure, or your or you know, or whatever. Or maybe you just need to reexamine what what you want to get out of music, you know. Maybe you have to get over that stigma of like I'm not performing, so I'm not a real musician. Yeah. You know. I know, yeah. You know. But I mean, but to, but in a in an honest sense, I, th I mean, the tour I think went very well. I think we, you know, some again, some nights went better than others, but I think we we had a good we had a good turnout overall. We, you know, sold a bunch of merch, and I think we'll hopefully re hit a bunch of these cities, and whenever we do, and, nice. and within the next Spring. six months or so, and Spring. I think hopefully, you'll, yeah, you'll get more people. And I think that's just like. 
you know, especially if, if how we operate anyways, that, that's, that's what you kind of got to do. You know, some people, again, it's not black and white. There's some people get an online presence. They got a YouTube channel and they get a whole lot of people watching their videos. And then just out of nowhere, they can go do a show someplace and a million people pop up. Yeah. But we kind of still operate in that more classic sense of like, we do the festivals, we go and we play a... Kind of you grow, grow your audience... The old-fashioned way. Through the live performance, yeah. Yeah, and like... Well, you're going to be on television coming up here. I don't know if I'm going to let let denounce that yet. Okay, sorry. (laughs) No, you're good, you're good. Uh, But that's some... Definitely some big stuff. Uh, maybe, maybe, okay. maybe I'm overthinking. Wow, it. good thing I didn't. I just say any more. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but uh, but you know, like, I mean, that's it's not. Should a, I bleep that out? No, yeah, you're fine. You're fine. It's not, I mean, we'll probably announce it in a couple of days, anyways. Okay. I mean, it's not. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a big deal. Nobody's you know. probably listening to this anyway. Yeah, to the one person listening. <laughs> <laughs> Mom, Dad, yeah. don't tell anybody. Um, but uh, yeah, man, I think you know, for us, and I mean, in general, I think maybe. For us, what seems to be the kind of thing is sort of the death by a thousand strokes sort of method. It's just like, let's do radio and let's do, you know, TV and let's do Spotify and let's tour a lot and let's do festivals and let's do, and, you know, you just kind of make yourself ubiquitous and, you know, just hopefully you build up a fan base. And if you're not, you know, maybe, maybe then you're just, maybe you're just not that good, but, <laughs> but it seems it, so far it seems to be, it seems to be working. Yeah. So. It's just a very direct relationship between how many people you play in front of and no. how many people listen to your music. Yeah, man. You know, and, I, and I've, again, like a band like JJ Gray and Mofro is kind of a good example of that. Like JJ just kind of done in that the old fashioned way for forever. He just sort of was grinding for a better part of like what, 10, 15, 20 years. And now he can go and do his like tours and he'll play, you know, the Mr. Smalls or whatever of every city or so and he'll he'll do well you know and he doesn't have to tour as extensively you know anymore but you know some a conversation that really stuck with me is we we had um we opened up for uh saint paul and the broken bones when they played three rivers arts fest a couple years ago and we talked to um paul janeway the main guy and he was saying that he was kind of like he was just he was super nice he was just sort of talking to us about like where we were and like as far as like you know, the stepping stones of the music world. And we just kind of described all, all of this. And he said, yeah, man, you know, that's, that's what you got to do. He's like, we, we would, we played, you know, all these places. And the first time we played in, you know, Tucson, Arizona, we played the club and there was one guy, you know, and you, he said, and what he said to us is you play to that one guy. Like it's a, you know, it's like it's a crowd of 6,000, you know, and then you come back and there's 10 people and you come back and there's, thousand people you know who who knows you know yeah you know so you just you sometimes there's no substitute for the kind of good old-fashioned grind and again maybe you combine that with a hit song or yeah you know you you, you do whatever will help you along yeah. the way but it's just a tried and true yeah if you're, I mean, if you're you know making sure that you're doing a good job then yeah I mean, but take take a lot of these like jam bands for example you're, you're, you're talking about like these you know Humphreys mcgee and these all these different bands like they're not necessarily getting a song on the on top 40s you know they like a lot of their fan base is built up over years of playing festivals and just hitting the same cities over and over again like there's in in their case those people that come out to see live music they'll come out again to see you know if if they're going to a festival to see live music they will you are you're in the right place those people want to come see live music so if they like you they'll probably come see you the next time you're passing through yeah so you know there's that that there's not a good substitute necessarily for that sort of old good old fashioned grind. Yeah, you just can't reach people that way. Well, I've not been able to any yeah. other way. Well, and I mean, again, it's just you. And my my philosophy again is that just you sort of do all the things possible and whatever sort of works. Then really lean into that. You know, if yeah, if you're starting to have success here, like do that twice as much. You know, right. If you're Wolfpack and you're you know, just getting this crazy online base and Played, you, sell out Madison Square Garden. Yes, yeah, you sell out Madison Square Garden. <laughs> but they, but you know, they. I think people, you know, they they did a lot of, um, they did they did a fair amount of shows as well in New York. And um, I saw an interview recently with them where they talked about like all the shows in New York they did, and uh, you know, they they played they played Bonnaroo and all these festivals as well. Obviously, I mean, they I think they went from they had a pr- particularly 
steep climb, you know, but uh, I think they went from zero to a hundred very quickly, but um, you know, I think they, they, they did a lot of good things uh, across the board, you know, but, but if, if in their case, if you're doing really well with a YouTube channel and people are coming to see your YouTube videos, then lean hard into that. And they did, they, they kill social media and, 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 uh, their, their online presence is unbelievable, you know, but like our fan base maybe is a little older and just doesn't go on Instagram as much maybe, but, but they do come to live shows, you know, and they'll yeah. do the sort of old fashioned stuff. So, you know, yeah, it's important. Yeah. Cool. It's five forty seven. Five forty seven. Oh, good lord! I'm definitely shirking a lot of responsibilities. Oh man. <laughs> well, yeah. we'll have we to do this again. This. We'll yeah. have to do this again sometime because we always have so much to talk. About. Yeah, there's more. There's yeah. more I, I could talk about, but yeah, yeah. that's enough for now. <laughs> Goodbye for now. Yeah. One person. <laughs> Well, John, thanks for thanks for having me. It's always good talking to you. Yeah, thank you for being the first guest. First guest. It's really great talking to you about all this stuff. Theme music. Ah. Uh, <laughs> I wish that was hooked up. Yeah. Well, we'll we'll put that in post. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll yeah I'll dub some music in. Yeah, it'll be really killing. It'll be way better than I thought I could come up with.